Good afternoon and welcome to another exciting episode of The Legal Anchor. Today we will be talking about carriage of goods by sea and we will be dealing with contracts of carriage by sea. Therefore, what we will now see today will be how the goods are being moved from one point to another. This is done by the use of various persons. Now there are many persons involved in the shipping of goods by sea. We have the ship owner. They have various liners or ships that they may use. In carrying these goods, we have, when we say liners, we mean the type of ship. Now we have our commercial and we have our private. The private ones will have someone who charters the vessel. The other ones we have may also be somebody who not only charters the vessel but we have the commercial one where they cannot deny anyone and this is where they do a particular ply a particular route in doing this what we observe is that various persons play a major role there are many persons in the shipping of goods and these persons are made mention of legally under the law all of these persons are to be observed and have specific obligations. We see persons such as the stevedores. They are made mention of. They may be considered auxiliary, but however, they're just as important. We also see the customs officers. They're considered auxiliary, but they're just as important. We have the users. The users are persons who will be using the ship line and other persons such as that, freight forwarders. And we have the owners, those are the ship owners and those persons who ensure that they provide actual service that is needed for the goods to be shipped. Therefore, we now understand that there are many persons involved in this industry. For example, right now we have a truck passing us. This would be considered a secondary because they ensure that the goods are being carried to its location. However, we know that these persons under the law have an obligation to ensure that the goods arrive at the port on time because if it is late, it will hit the mortgage. All of these things are of vital importance. So in knowing that this is of vital importance, we know that the workers who are on there will also are of vital importance. You will even see some workers even walking past me as I'm doing this video. They are of vital importance because they're also maybe there to load, unload and all of these things. Extremely important. And the law makes mention of this. We know that every person under the law who works in the shipping industry must be somehow have had lawful possession of the goods. They get it through that bill of laden. So when the Bill of Laden gives these people lawful possession of the goods, it is for them to do it in furtherance of the contract. So we understand that maritime law is just that, ensuring that each and every person involved in the trade is doing what is expected of them. In furtherance of ensuring that each person who is supposed to ensure the goods are carried know their duties, we can see just behind me there is a ship and on the ship would have been the cargo. So, what happens is, each person who is entitled to do what they're supposed to do, example, the trucker, as we see here coming off, what happens is that the trucker is going to have to make sure that they collect the goods. How do they collect it? By ensuring that they have the chassis. Now, the chassis is what is used to put the goods that is loaded on to the truck. So the chassis is placed on the truck and once this chassis is placed on the trucker then goes and collects the goods. The goods are then collected from the point of origin carried to the ship on which it is the vessel it is to be carried and is then carried. So we see how important just this person the trucker alone is because if it wasn't for them these goods already could end up being delayed. So they have to ensure that they get it properly. So that's just an example 
of one of the persons who are extremely important. Another organization that we said is extremely important to the shipping of goods by sea is the shipping associations. Right here we see the shipping association of Jamaica. The shipping association of Jamaica's role is one where they oversee what is going on and ensure that the industry is being regulated and things are being done properly because what they need to ensure is that all of these goods are being handled properly and that the items and that the shipping industry in our country is upheld to a very high standard. This is just an example of an auxiliary that is extremely important, the trucker, the, the shipping authority, associations, are also persons, a group of persons that do their best to uphold the standards of the industry. Now, we will go into further discourse as you will watch the question and answer segment, which goes even into more details on this topic. Thank you. Welcome guys, welcome to another episode of the Students Digest. I am your host, Tyrese Williams. Again, we have Mr. Jermaine Reed. This is a very long series. Thank you. A long series. Thank you for being here, Mr. Reed. Thank you. We will be discussing today maritime trade and contracts of carriage of goods by sea. Mr. Reed, yes. we are... Happy to have you here on the Students Digest Thank again. You. you have been very informative in our sessions. Yeah. We hope, I hope, that the students or whoever is watching our podcast or watching or listening to our podcast, I hope you guys are truly informed and you make your own notes and learn as much as you can from this series. So today we'll be discussing maritime trade and the contracts of carriage. Yes. Now, Mr. Reed, the transportation of goods by sea is a very, very complex, yes, somewhat complex process. It, it is involves, very complex. It involves many, many parties, right? And to ensure that every party knows their roles, there are contracts that must, must be drafted. Yes. So, you know, for the person who is shipping the goods, the person who is receiving the goods, everybody must know what it is that they are supposed to do. So today, we will be understanding, we will be discussing the maritime transportation train chain, sorry, as well as the contracts that govern the carriage of goods by sea. Mr. Reed. Yes. The sh maritime transport tr chain. Mm -hmm. Could you give us some insight as to what sure. that is? As you said, starting off, the maritime transportation chain is a very complex one. It involves a lot of people every step of the way to ensure that the goods go from the seller to the buyer. It has to cross, sometimes it, it crosses time zones, um, it crosses jurisdiction, and in crossing jurisdictions, that means it's going to go through laws of different countries which are varying in order to ensure then that all of this is done with as smooth a transition as possible the contract has to be drafted for the transportation of goods so in terms of ensuring that the maritime trade is done there are various parties that we see emerging in this ensure in this um process so from this what we see we see first of all the providers mm. this is the person who's providing the ship so the ship owner yeah we also see the persons who will be using so the users so those would be the person to whom is purchasing the goods so they'll be making use you will see persons such as freight forwarding companies various persons who have to also make use of this and then you have the auxiliaries who are just as important in the shipping of these goods mm -hmm. and these auxiliaries include persons such as the customs officers very important very, exactly very important, guys. 
and apart from your customs officers, you have the crane operators. The port you, operators. You have the well. port operators. You have all of those persons who receive the goods to ensure that the goods are now making their way to the consumer. No. The, the auxiliaries aren't necessarily involved in the shipping person. No, they're not. They're not exactly involved in the shipping. They're not even named in the contract because they're not primary or even considered secondary, which is why we say auxiliary. Mm -hmm. Because when we look, we have the ship owner, so that's the person providing, and then we have the users. So these persons will more than likely, the high probability that they will be named on the contract. But... So do the auxiliaries. The auxiliaries are not named on the contract, but they are just as important. important. And this is all underpinned by the contract. Okay. Because we see that all of these persons are guided by law. Thank you. And case law. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Now, the, the legal arrangement between shipper and ship owner is somewhat different. I have mm -hmm. noted this. Uh, I have noted the difference between the two uh, where the contracts are different for the shipper and the ship owner uh, as it is different from the buyer and the seller yes right so what we want you to do first is uh, to give us a little elaboration you know what I mean a little elaboration as to who is who who does what the types of carriers okay come, right so, so, so the types of carriers that we have we have the private carrier and the common carrier. Once again, let me specify. The carrier is another name for the ship operator. So we know that the ship owner or operator can also be called the carrier. Mm -hmm. So when you hear carrier, you know that it is synonymous. The words are the same. So what it is now, you have your private carriers. The private carriers, now they have char you can charter their vessels so you can charter the vessel to do a particular voyage to carry your items whereas you have the common carriers these ones tend to do a specific route so these persons are advertised that they do this route and once there is space on their ship they have to carry your goods there are certain exceptions however where they may deny carrying your goods where Maybe the goods that you are shipping, they, their ship is not retrofitted to it's carry it. Because yeah. we know that certain things have to be carried in a certain type of ship. Yeah. Livestock cannot go sometimes on the regular ship. Other things may not be able to go on the regular ship. Grain may not be able to go. So therefore, we see that emerging. So with that said, we now know that our private carrier and our common carriers they both are integral to this shipping industry to the maritime transportation chain. exactly yeah, and very... once again to the law uh, because they're guided by the law okay so we are going on a journey yes right we're going on a journey to find out how the transportation chain operates the players involved we have gone through that and now we are speeding ahead to the carriage of goods by sea what governs the carriage of goods by sea so mr reed i saw where there are different categories of cargoes you know what i mean uh there are categories there are cargoes that have to be containerized there are cargoes that have to be um packed just in the vessel randomly like that mm -hmm. so could you go ahead and give us some uh some insight as to the different types of cargoes okay so the cargo you have various as you said cargo so now that we know this what we need to understand is that you have containerization and you have for example the bulk containerization means it's been placed in those containers and this containerization revolutionized the shipping industry it allowed us to put cargo into these containers that they can be moved mm -hmm. not everything we know however can go into containers by their very nature some things cannot go in them such as grain we'll say that grain cannot is not placed that way so that is shipped indifferently so from that we see that would be a bulk 
cargo. Bull, cargo. That would be bulk. Mm -hmm. So from that, we see the various types of cargo emerging and how they are to be carried. And the law specifies when we are carrying these cargos, how they are to be carried, and the various contracts that emerge depending on which one of the cargo we are carrying. So what contract then would govern the carriage of grain, for example? Okay, so that would be specified in your contract that you are carrying grain and how you want it to be packed. Because we all know that grain has to be packed a certain way because it can move during the voyage and if all the grain shifts to one side, it can actually cause the ship to actually become lopsided and ultimately turn over, which would end up into a major disaster. Okay, so then Mr. Mm -hmm. Reed, what I want to know is what contract governs the carriage of this grain? Okay, well the contract, as I said, you know, what really there is no specific contract, it's how it is drafted. Ah, okay. okay. So it's how it's drafted. We have various <laughs> rules, which is for later on, we'll probably talk about that, like the Hamburg, Rotterdam, these rules, some of them speak directly to carrying grains, livestock, various things. So one may use one of these rules to assist them in drafting their contract. Okay, thank you. A couple more topics left to discuss. We will look at the Charter Party, you know, which is, as you know, a very important part of maritime trade. Very, very important part. Mr. Reed. A charter party, please discuss. Okay, so a charter party is a contractual obligation as to how you are going to be carrying these goods. So it's a contract dictating the way in which the vessel is going to be used. Mm -hmm. And the best way for me to just say is just to give you the ways. You have your time charter, you have your voyage charter, and you have your demise or bareboat charter. So these are the types of charter These are the parties. types of charter parties okay. that we see. And in your contract, once again, this term would be, this would be one of the terms because you would say how you are using the vessel. Mm -hmm. So if you are using the vessel as a time charter, that means you have, you have leased or rented this vessel for a particular period of time, of time. to do your business. Mm -hmm. If you are taking the, 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 the ship on a voyage charter, it means you are chartering it for a specific voyage. As the name suggests. As the name suggests. Mm -hmm. And demise or bare boat charter means that you are just taking the bare boat. That is it. You are just getting the bare boat. No crew, no nothing. You will supply everything else thereafter. And we see that also... And I want to say the leading case right here now is Hong Kong Fur. So, I invite you to read that case. The case of it. Hong Kong Fur, guys. It talks about it and what occurred. So. All right, thank you, Mr. Reed. Yes. Thank you. We see where a couple of other terms are being uh, thrown out. We see that uh, all of these um, terms, yes. as you say, is... They are underpinned in the contract of sale. The Bill of Lading assists parties in, in knowing their responsibilities of, uh, at every stage of the maritime transportation trade. Chain. What I want you now to do, Mr. Reed, is just to conclude for us. Mm -hmm. the, the, the maritime trade and contract of carriage. The entire thing. Okay. So the maritime trade and contract of carriage. The best way to summarize it is it's a contract, as we said, and the definition of a contract, once again, is a legally binding document between two or more persons. This definition was given to us by Lloyd Diplock. Now, the maritime aspect of it is going to be guided that the contract will be drafted using various terms. So you will have terms in there, such as dealing with your insurance of your goods. Mm -hmm. You'll have terms in there dealing with your shippers. Mm -hmm. How, what, which shipper would we be using? Yeah. You will have the terms in there dealing with the users, which users will be coming into play. You will also see in this very same contract the type of charter party being um, used. Whether it is a time a charter. A time how we're going to be shipping this item. Yeah. Um, all of those things you will see coming into play okay. when we're doing we'll see the ship owner prom feature quite prominently in there 
all of that and of course the type of cargo will feature because that will guide probably the type of ship we can use to carry our goods and once again what i want you to remember when this contract is drafted it is a very detailed contract however the law states when you draft a contract of goods by sea a bill of laden is to be drafted after a bill of lading is to be drafted after which means this bill of lading is now going to have the details of the shipper the consignee of the um, basically the details the, of the shipment the details but it won't go too detailed because remember you have a contract yeah so it will highlight the most important things mm -hmm. So it will highlight the international commercial trading term being used, mm -hmm. the, Inca, the term. Inca term. You will see that in there. You will also see the goods are insured. You will also see the type of good. The type of goods. Mm -hmm. You will see where it is going. You will see, as I said, the voyage and time charter. All of these things you'll see on the bill of lading. So therefore, the contract and the bill of lading run side by side. And that is what we have to always remember in carriage of goods by sea law and more so in maritime trade and contract for carriage of goods by sea. It is contract law. End of story. Thank you so much, Mr. Reed. Yes. For your time and information. You're welcome. We have so much more to discuss on this topic. However, we will only have to wait for a part two. So there... Look out for it guys, a part 2 for this series is coming. We will be discussing in depth maritime trade and contract of carriage by sea. Thank you again Mr. Yes, Chairman thank you very much. For being it was once again a pleasure being here. Thank